Hello, this is Boomer Rocks. I put a special treat for you today. I put together a compilation of Basil Rathbone reading Edgar Allan Poe poems. Now, there are versions out there with Vincent Price, but I think Basil Rathbone's readings are much more enthralling, much more riveting, as only a Shakespearean-trained stage actor can give you. I think Vincent Price's readings are a bit too pedestrian, a bit too Hollywood character actor reading of them. Whereas you can hear Rathbone chewing on every single word. He really understands the context of what Edgar Allan Poe was trying to say. Um, With his low, wonderful baritone voice, he's sometimes quick and sometimes very, very slow. And he plays with the dynamics of his voice and really, really acts out these poems. I think Edgar Allan Poe would be very proud of Basil Rathbone's reading of these poems. Well over an hour, I took the best sources I could find, made them consistent across all in terms of EQ, compression, oral excitement, de-essing, de reverb. You named it, I remastered it. Enjoy over one hour of Basil Rathbone reading Edgar Allan Poe. Gaily bedight, a gallant knight in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old, this knight so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow fell as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. A shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a merriment their melody foretells, how they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight. Keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintinnabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells. What a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight from the molten golden notes, and all in tune, what a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells, how it swells, how it dwells on the future. How it tells of the rapture that impels To the swinging and the ringing of the bells, bells, bells Of the bells, 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 bells To the rhyming and the chiming of the bells Hear the loud alarm bells, brazen bells What a tale of terror now their turbulency tells In the startled ear of night How they scream out their affright Too much horrified to speak They can only shriek, shriek, out of tune, in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation of the deaf and frantic fire, leaping higher, 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 with a desperate desire, and a resolute endeavor now, now to sit or never, by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, 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 what a tale their terror tells of despair, how they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they have poured on the bosom of the palpitating air, yet the ear it fully knows, by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows, yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells, what a world of solemn thought their melody compels, in the silence of the night how we shiver with affright, at the melancholy menace of their tone, for every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan, and the people, 
Ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple all alone and who tolling, tolling, tolling in that muffled monotone feel a glory in so rolling on the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman. They are neither brute nor human. They are ghouls, and their king it is who tolls, and he rolls, 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 rolls a paean from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells, and he dances and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of ironic rhyme, to the paean of the bells, of the bells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 bells. To the moaning and the groaning of the bells. For the most wild yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburden my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than uh, baroques. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive in the circumstances I detail with awe nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals. I was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. Now, this peculiarity of character grew with my growth and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of a most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusions to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, and I mention the matter at all for no better reason than that it happens just now to be remembered. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew day by day more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length I even offered her personal violence. 
My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when by accident or through affection they came in my way. But my disease grew upon me. For what disease is like alcohol? And at length even Pluto, who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him. When in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin-nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush. I burn. I shudder when I pen the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was, at best, a feeble and equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess, and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit, philosophy takes no account. Yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart one of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man. Who has not, a hundred times, found himself committing a vile or stupid action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cold blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes, and with the bitterest remorse at my heart, hung it because I knew that it had loved me, and because I felt it had given me no reason of offence, hung it because I knew that in so doing I was committing a sin, a deadly sin, that would so jeopardise my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful, the most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this most cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by a cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity, but I am detailing a chain of facts and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house and against which 
had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here in great measure resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd was collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention. The words strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw as if graven in bar relief upon the white surface the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length reflection came to my aid. The cat I remembered had been hung in the garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled with a crowd, by someone of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of the other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat. And during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented. For another pet of the same species, and of somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat half Stupefied in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum, which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it, touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto and closely resembling him in every aspect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it of the landlord. But this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses. And when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once and became immediately a great favourite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but I know not how or why it was. Its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed me. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into bitterness and hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not for some weeks strike or otherwise violently ill-use it. But gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence. What added, no doubt, to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, 
it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I've already said, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down, or, fastening its long, sharp claws in my dress, clamber in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from so doing, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by an absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I'm almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon's cell, I'm almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name. And for this above all, I loathed and dreaded, and would rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows. O oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death. And now I was indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity. A brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed. A brute beast to work out for me, for me, a man fashioned in the image of the high God. So much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former, the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of a thing upon my face and its vast weight, an incarnate nightmare that I'd no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind. While from the sudden, frequent and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and most patient of sufferers. One day she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty had compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs and nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness, uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow at the animal, which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. Goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal, I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. 
Many projects entered my mind. At one period, I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another, I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Again, I deliberated about casting it in the well in the yard and packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar as the monks of the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted its walls were loosely constructed and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster in which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before, so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation, I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar, I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position while with a little trouble I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand and hair, with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I'd finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here at least, then, my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had at length firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep and blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept, even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a free man. The monster in terror had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries have been made, but these have been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came very unexpectedly into the house and proceeded again to make rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered, not a muscle. My heart beat calmly, as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word by way of triumph and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. A gentleman, I said at last as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. 
I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. Uh, by the by, gentlemen, this, um, this is a very well-constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say, an excellently well-constructed house. These walls, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane which I held in my hand upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch-fiend! No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry, at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exult in their damnation. Of my own thoughts, it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party on the stairs remained motionless through extremity of terror and awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. Uh, this was a point definitely settled, and the very definiteness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship of wine. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by a the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for a Montiado, and I have my doubts. How? said he. Montiado? A pipe? Impossible. In the middle of the carnival? I have my doubts, I replied. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. Uh, you were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado? And I must satisfy them. Amontillado? Um, as you're engaged, I'm on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me, Lucchese cannot tell a Montiado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. 
Come, let us go. <coughs> Whither? Uh, <coughs> to your vaults. <laughs> oh, my dear friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive that you have an engagement. Lucchese, uh, <coughs> I, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Bontiano! Oh, you've been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking of what you now told, possessed himself of my arm. Uh, putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roculaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honour of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces to Flambeau, and giving one to Fortunato, uh, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, uh, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. <coughs> the pipe, he said. Uh, it's further on, said I. Uh, but observe the uh, white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of his intoxication. Nitre, he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. Uh, how long have you had that cough? <laughs> <coughs> my poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. Uh, it's nothing, he said at last. Uh, come, I said. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese. Enough, he said. The cough uh, is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. Uh, true, I replied. But you should use all proper caution. A draught of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Uh, here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mould. Drink, I said, presenting the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. Uh, these vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. Oh, I... Uh, I forget your arms. Ah, a huge human foot door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impuni lacessit. No one provokes me with impunity. <coughs> oh, good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by the arm above the elbow. The nighter, I said, uh, see, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. Uh, we are below the river bed. Uh, the drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Uh, your cough. Well, it is, uh, it's nothing, he said. Let us go. Uh, but first, uh, another draught to the Medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upward with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, 
a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Uh, then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes. Yes, I replied. Yes. You? Impossible. A Mason? A Mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my roquelaire. Are you jest? he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Montiado. Uh, be it so, I said replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another, less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the old catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall, thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavoured to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Here is the Amontillado. As for Lucchese, well, he's an ignoramus interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astonished to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Uh, pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado! ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied. The Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance to the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier and the third and the fourth. Then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction, I ceased my labours and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau, over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. Uh... Ah! 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 A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chain form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, 
I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamoured. I re-echoed! I aided! I surpassed them in volume and in strength! I did this. And the clamour grew still. It was now midnight. And my task was drawing to a close. I completed the eighth, the ninth and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <coughs> A very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. Uh, we will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> uh, the Amontillado, I said. <coughs> yes, the Amontillado. Uh, but is it not uh, getting late? It will not they be waiting us at the palazzo, the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montressor. Yes, I said. For the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. Fortunato! No answer. I called again. Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. Uh, on account of the dampness of the catacombs, I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat. Lo, death has reared himself a throne in a strange city, lying alone far down within the dim west where the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. Their shrines and palaces and towers, time-eaten towers that tremble not, resemble nothing that is ours, around by lifting winds forgot, resignedly beneath the sky the melancholy waters lie. No rays from the holy heaven come down on the long night time of that town, but light from out the lurid sea streams up the turret silently, gleams up the pinnacles far and free, up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon-like walls, up shadowy long-forgotten bowers of sculptured ivy, and stone flowers, up many and many a marvelous shrine whose wreathed friezes intertwine the vial, the violet and the vine. Resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. So blend the turrets and shadows there that all seem pendulous in air, while from a proud tower in the town, death looks gigantically down. Their open fanes and gaping graves yawn level with the luminous waves, but not the riches there that lie in each idol's diamond eye, not the gaily jeweled dead 
tempt the waters from their bed. For no ripples curl, alas, along that wilderness of glass. No swellings tell that winds may be upon some far off happier sea. No heavings hint that winds have been on seas less hideously serene. But lo, a stir is in the air. The wave, there is a movement there. As if the towers had thrust aside in slightly sinking the dull tide. As if their tops had feebly given a void within the filmy heaven. The waves have now a redder glow. The hours are breathing faint and low. And when, amid no earthly moans, down, down that town shall settle hence, hell, rising from a thousand thrones, shall do it reverence. Of course, I shall not pretend to consider it any matter for wonder that the extraordinary case of Monsieur Valdemar has excited discussion. It would have been a miracle had it not, especially under the circumstances. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts as far as I comprehend them myself. They are succinctly these. Uh, my attention uh, for the last three years had been repeatedly drawn to the subject of mesmerism. And about nine months ago, it occurred to me quite suddenly that in the series of experiments made hitherto, there had been a very remarkable and most unaccountable omission. No person had as yet been mesmerized in articulo mortis. It remained to be seen first, whether in such condition there existed in the patient any susceptibility to the magnetic influence. Secondly, whether, if any existed, it was impaired or increased by the condition. Thirdly, to what extent or for how long a period the encroachments of death might be arrested by the process. In looking around me for some subject by whose means I might test these particulars, I was brought to think of my friend Monsieur Ernest Valdemar, the well-known compiler of the Bibliotheca Forensica and author under the nom de plume of Isaac Marx of the Polish versions of Wallenstein and Gargantua. Uh, Monsieur Valdemar, who has resided principally at Harlem, New York, since the year 1839, is, or was, uh, particularly noticeable for the extreme spareness of his person. His lower limbs much resembling those of John Randolph, and also for the whiteness of his whiskers, in violent contrast to the blackness of his hair, the latter in consequence being very generally mistaken for a wig. His temperament was markedly nervous, and rendered him a good subject for mesmeric experiment. On two or three occasions, I put him to sleep with little difficulty, but was disappointed in other results, uh, which his peculiar constitution had naturally led me to anticipate. His will was at no period positively or thoroughly under my control. I always attributed my failure at these points to the disordered state of his health. For some months previous to my becoming acquainted with him, his physicians had declared him in a confirmed tisis. It was his custom, indeed, to speak calmly of his approaching dissolution, as of a matter neither to be avoided nor regretted. When the ideas to which I have alluded first occurred to me, it was, of course, very natural that I should think of Monsieur Valdemar. I knew the steady philosophy of the man too well to apprehend any scruples from him and he had no relatives in America who would be likely to interfere. I spoke to him frankly upon the subject, and to my surprise, his interest seemed vividly excited. I say to my surprise, for although he had always yielded his person freely to my experiments, he had never before given me any tokens of sympathy with what I did. His disease was of that character which would admit of exact calculation in respect to the epoch of its termination in death. And it was finally arranged between us that he would send for me about 24 hours before the period announced by his physicians as that of his decease. It is now rather more than seven months since I received from Monsieur Valdemar himself the subjoined note. My dear P, you may as well come now. D and F are agreed that I cannot hold up beyond tomorrow midnight, and I think they have hit the time very nearly. Valdemar. I received this note within half an hour after it was written, and in 15 minutes more, I was in the dying man's chamber. I had not seen him for 10 days, and was a
appalled by the fearful alteration which the brief interval had wrought in him. His face wore a leaden hue, the eyes were utterly lustreless, and the emaciation was so extreme that the skin had been broken through by the cheekbones. Doctors D and F were in attendance. After pressing Valdemar's hand, I took these gentlemen aside and obtained from them a minute account of the patient's condition. The left lung had been for 18 months in a semi-osseous or cartilaginous state, and was, of course, entirely useless for all purposes of vitality. The right in its upper portion was also partially, if not thoroughly, ossified, while the lower region was merely a mass of purulent tubercles, running one into another. It was the opinion of both physicians that Monsieur Valdemar would die about midnight on the morrow, Sunday. It was then about seven o'clock on Saturday evening. When they'd gone, I spoke freely with Monsieur Valdemar on the subject of his approaching dissolution, as well as, uh, more particularly, of the experiment proposed. It wanted about five minutes of eight when, taking the patient's hand, I begged him to state as distinctly as he could whether he was entirely willing that I should make the experiment of mesmerizing him in his then condition. He replied feebly, yet quite audibly, Yes, I wish to be mesmerized. I fear you have deferred it too long. While he spoke thus, I commenced the passes, which I had already found most effectual in subduing him. He was evidently influenced with the first lateral stroke of my hand across his forehead, but although I exerted all my powers, no further perceptible effect was induced until some minutes after ten o'clock, when doctors D and F called according to appointment. I explained to them in a few words what I designed, and as they opposed no objection, saying that the patient was already in the death agony, I proceeded without hesitation exchanging, however, the lateral passes for downward ones and directing my gaze entirely into the right eye of the sufferer. By this time his pulse was imperceptible and his breathing was stertorous, and at intervals of half a minute. The patient's extremities were of an icy coldness. At five minutes before eleven, I perceived unequivocal signs of mesmeric influence. The glassy roll of the eye was changed for that expression of uneasy inward examination, which is never seen except in cases of sleep-waking. With a few rapid lateral passes, I made the lids quiver, as in incipient sleep, and with a few more, I closed them altogether. I was not satisfied, however, with this, but continued the manipulations vigorously and with the fullest exertion of the will until I had completely stiffened the limbs of the slumberer after placing them in a seemingly easy position. When I had accomplished this, it was fully midnight, and I requested the gentleman present to examine Monsieur Valdemar's condition. The pulse was imperceptible. The breathing was gentle, scarcely noticeable, unless through the application of a mirror to the lips. The eyes were closed naturally, and the limbs were as rigid and as cold as marble. Still, the general appearance was certainly not that of death, as I approached Monsieur Valdemar, I made a kind of half effort to influence his right arm into pursuit of my own, as I passed the latter gently to and fro above his person. In such experiments with this patient, I had never perfectly succeeded before, and assuredly I had little thought of succeeding now. But to my astonishment, his arm very readily, although feebly, followed every direction I assigned it with mine. I determined to hazard a few words of conversation. Monsieur Valdemar, I said, you asleep? He made no answer, but I perceived a tremor about his lips and was thus induced to repeat the question again and again. At the third repetition, his whole frame was agitated by a very slight shivering the eyelids unclosed themselves so far as to display a white line of a ball. The lips moved sluggishly, and from between them, in a barely audible whisper, issued the words, Yes, asleep now. Do not wake me. Let me die so. 
It was now the opinion, or rather the wish of the physicians, that Monsieur Valdemar should be suffered to remain undisturbed in his present apparently tranquil condition until death should supervene. And this, it was generally agreed, must now take place within a few minutes. I concluded, however, to speak to him once more, and merely repeated my previous question. While I spoke, there came a marked change over the countenance of the sleep waker. The eyes rolled themselves slowly open, the pupils disappearing upwardly. The skin generally assumed a cadaverous hue, resembling not so much parchment as white paper, and the circular hectic spots which hitherto had been strongly defined in the centre of each cheek went out at once. I use this expression because the suddenness of their departure put me in mind of nothing so much as the extinguishment of a candle by a puff of breath. The upper lip at the same time writhed itself away from the teeth, which it had previously covered completely, while the lower jaw fell with an audible jerk, leaving the mouth widely extended and disclosing a full view of the swollen and blackened tongue. I presume the new member of the party then present had been unaccustomed to deathbed horrors, but so hideous beyond conception was the appearance of Monsieur Valdemar at this moment that there was a general shrinking back from the region of the bed. I now feel that I have reached a point in this narrative at which every reader will be startled into positive disbelief. It is my business, however, simply to proceed. There was no longer the faintest sign of vitality in Monsieur Valdemar and concluding him to be dead, we were consigning him to the charge of the nurses when a strong vibratory motion was observable in the tongue. This continued for perhaps a minute. At the expiration of this period, there issued from the distended and motionless jaws a voice, such as it would be madness in me to attempt describing. Monsieur Valdemar spoke obviously in reply to a question I had propounded to him a few minutes before. I had asked him, it will be remembered, if he still slept. He now said, No, I have been sleeping and now, now I am Dead. No person present even affected to deny or attempt to repress the unutterable shuddering horror which these few words thus uttered were so well calculated to convey. The nurses immediately left the chamber and could not be induced to return. My own impressions I would not pretend to render intelligible to the reader without the utterance of a word. We addressed ourselves again to an investigation of Monsieur Valdemar's condition. It remained in all respects as I have last described it, with the exception that the mirror no longer afforded evidence of respiration. An attempt to draw blood from the arm failed. The only real indication of the mesmeric influence was now found in the vibratory motion of the tongue whenever I addressed Monsieur Valdemar a question. He seemed to be making an effort to reply, but had no longer sufficient volition. I believe that I have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleep-waker's state at this epoch. It was evident that so far death, or what is usually termed death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us all that to awaken Monsieur Valdemar would be merely to ensure his instant, or at least his speedy, dissolution. From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months. We continued to make daily calls at Monsieur Valdemar's house, accompanied now and then by medical or other friends. All this time, the sleep waker remained exactly as I have last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him. And it is the perhaps unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose 
of relieving Monsieur Valdemar from mesmeric trance, I made use of the customary passes. These, for a time, were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed as especially remarkable that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids, of a pungent and highly offensive odor. Dr. F. then intimated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. Monsieur Valdemar, can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now? There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered, or rather rolled violently in the mouth, although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before. And at length, the same hideous voice which I've already described broke forth. Oh, God, sake, quick, quick, put me to sleep. Oh, quick, awaken me, quick. I say to you that I am dead, 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 dead. I was thoroughly unnerved and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first I made an endeavour to recompose the patient, but failing in this, through total abeyance of the will, I retracted my steps and as earnestly struggled to awaken him. In this attempt I soon saw that I should be successful, or at least I soon fancied that my success would be complete, and I am sure that all in the room were prepared to see the patient awaken. For what really occurred, however, it is quite impossible that any human being could have been prepared. As I rapidly made the mesmeric passes, amid ejaculations of dead, dead, absolutely bursting from the tongue and not from the lips of the sufferer, his whole frame at once shrunk, crumbled, absolutely rotted away beneath my hands. Upon the bed before the whole company, there lay a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putrescence. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, a radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odor went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows, saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law, round about a throne where sitting, poor Fierogine, in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed. And travellers now within that valley, through the red litten windows, see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. Not long ago, the writer of these lines and the mad pride of intellectuality maintained the power of words 
denied that ever a thought arose within the human brain beyond the utterance of the human tongue. And now, as if in mockery of that boast, two words, two foreign soft syllables, Italian tones made only to be murmured by angels, dreaming in the moonlit dew that hangs like chains of pearl on Hermon Hill, have stirred from out the abysses of his heart unthought like thoughts that are the souls of thought richer, far wilder, far diviner visions than even the seraph harper Israfel, who has the sweetest voice of all God's creatures, could hope to utter. And I, my spells are broken. The pen falls powerless from my shivering hand. With thy dear name as text, though bidden by thee, I cannot write, I cannot speak or think. Alas, I cannot feel, for tis not feeling this standing motionless upon the golden threshold of the wide open gate of dreams, gazing entranced down the gorgeous vista and thrilling as I see upon the right, upon the left, and all the way along, amid unpurpled vapours, far away to where the prospect terminates, thee only. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten law, while I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, "'some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'This it is, and nothing more.' Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, "'but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, "'and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, "'that I scarce was sure I heard you. "'Here I opened wide the door.' Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment of this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter when... With many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door. Perched upon the bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. Perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven. 
the ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast, upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whose unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hopes that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease, reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee respite, respite and nepenthe from my memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Worth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is the, is the balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I sweet upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest of the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes of all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul, from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor, shall be lifted. Nevermore.